Thank you. How's everybody doing this afternoon? Good. All right, everybody's awake. We don't have the lunch crash going on here? Okay. All right, you do? Okay. This row right here has designated themselves as my co-presenters, so there might be a little bit of a conversation going on here. Okay. My name is Joanne Catania. I'm currently the Chief Investigator for the Medical Examiner's Office at Western Michigan University Homer Stryker School of Medicine. Anybody familiar with that new facility? Okay, well now you are. It's a new medical school uh, and we're, also, we're part of the medical school but we're, uh, our medical examiner's office is located within the building. Um, so my role as the chief uh, investigator for the medical examiner's office is I am in charge of investigations. We have four counties, uh, Muskegon, Allegan, Calhoun, and Kalamazoo. I'm in charge of making sure investigations are done well at, these, uh, at death scenes that happen in these counties. I have about 30 investigators that I train and review their reports. So I do a lot of uh, report reading. So I have a lot of experience in reading the reports of others. <laughs> um, also, uh, I was a police officer uh, prior to that uh, for 15 years at Holland. Part of my experience at Holland was I was an evidence technician. I was also part of the crisis negotiation team and I uh, was on the unrecovered narcotics team for a couple of years. Um, I also, during my spare time at Holland as a police officer, I also worked part-time as a medical examiner investigator for Allegan County. My background is education-wise, Grand Valley State University, uh, bachelor's in criminal justice, went to their police academy, and then I have a master's in public administration as well. And I'm also uh, a diplomat with the American Board of Medical Legal Death Investigators. So we'll start out with just a little story about report writing. I have a new investigator. He had been in law enforcement for about 10 years. Really nice guy, does a really good job at investigations. But I approached him one day, I said, you know, your reports are suffering. They're suffering because you're struggling with um, punctuation. And, <laughs> and uh, I explained to him, I said, you don't seem to have, and he came back and told me how he had problems with understanding the comma. And so he sometimes uses it incorrectly. And I explained to him that from the last report I read, it appears that he had abandoned all hope on commas and hadn't used one in his entire report. So he sends me this, telling me that I was the grammar police and starts kind of picking on me. So I send him back this. Please don't be a psycho, use commas. Okay, so there's a lot of fun things you can learn about writing. I know sometimes writing is hard but it doesn't mean that writing can't be fun. Um, and there's a purpose to it. So, um, like I said, don't be a psycho, use commas. Okay, so one of the continual themes you will hear, um, obviously you've heard, and that's why you're at the symposium today, is about is writing. So uh, what you're gonna hear in law enforcement, who's here, who's interested in law enforcement? A couple guys, a couple people. Did you raise your hand too? Anybody else? Give me another field. Who else? Is, what are you guys interested in? Engineering. Engineering. Teaching. Teaching. What are you interested in? Where are you looking to study? Uh, business management. Business management. Okay. How about Keeson? Keeson, what are you studying? I'm going for like a bioengineering. Okay. All right. What you're going to see is, in, which you've probably, when you went to the different fields, you've gone to listen to different people speak. You've heard them talk about writing. Oh, it's important, but one of the things you're going to see in investigations is report writing. Report writing is extremely important. Um, it's going to be a continual theme. You'll, if you're in law enforcement, you're going to constantly get back a report saying this is missing, that's missing, uh, or what, what happened here, what happened there. One of the things in law enforcement or investigations that's really important for you to understand is that if you don't put it in a report, uh, it's like it never happened. So think about how important that could be uh, if you don't indicate in your report that you read to somebody their Miranda rights and you interviewed them and they confessed to a crime. That could be important, right? Okay, so um, we're gonna talk about some seven, seven points here I have about report writing. And we'll go through these and then I'm gonna to talk to them mostly from the perspective of investigation as well as from like report writing from an officer perspective. But think about how these points are 
applicable in anything. If you're writing a presentation for one of your classes, regardless if it's engineering or it's law enforcement, you're going to have, you, these are seven points you need to, to at least think about when you're writing a uh, paper. So who is your audience? You need to know who you're writing for. Um, this is important. Why is this important? Anybody have a gander as to why that might be important? Somebody can understand your, your technical language. Right. So if you have one engineer writing to another engineer, you're going to use some terminology that if I read it, it might just be a lot of gibberish to me and a lot of numbers and symbols and whatnot versus somebody else reads it. Uh, you know, another engineer reads it, it might be great. But in investigative work as well in law enforcement, you have a huge, you have a huge uh, audience pool. Uh, you have the citizens, because all reports are FOIAble, the Freedom of Information Act. You can obtain reports. You also have judges, you have police officers. So let's think about two police officers talking to each other about a case. And I, may, and, you know, I might talk to another officer and say, oh yeah, it's a 187. Anybody ever hear the term 187? Okay. I don't know exactly what it means to develop. I have heard it. Okay. Do you know what it means? It's a uh, code term for murder. It's murder, but I think it's a California penal code. 187 is murder. The only reason I just, I just happen to know that, but if another Michigan officer was talking to a California officer and he talked to him, he made a reference in his report about a 187, they both are they have no idea what's going on. You don't know what's, what's being communicated, so plain English is good. Um, also, an officer talks, may say in their report, I responded to an MDOP or an MDP. Anybody know what that is? So if you were reading a police report and it said I responded to an MDP, you wouldn't know that that meant malicious destruction of property. So is it important to not use these abbreviations, but also to know who your audience is, who you're talking to? So one officer might talk to another officer that way, but you don't want to communicate that in your report. So you think about media, they're also your audience. You have just the public in general we're talking about because your reports are open to Freedom of Information Act. Uh, juries, juries have to understand what you're referring to, right? And attorneys, they, uh, whether it be a prosecuting attorney or a defense attorney, they're going to be your target audience. So if you were to write your reports and your sentences look like this, it's really nice and pretty and you know, we're not writing for literary purposes so you have to read this a couple times and understand, try and understand what this person's saying. So I, for law enforcement and investigative purposes this kind of uh, dialogue wouldn't be appropriate. So then you have to talk about what's your purpose of your, of your uh, investigative report. What's your purpose of your writing? So in law enforcement, you may, is it to persuade somebody? Is it to be scholarly? Is it just to deliver the facts? Or is it to advocate? And I'm adding on the advocate one because now as, a, as an investigator for the medical examiner's office, it's one of the things I, I push upon my investigators that you are advocating for the decedent. You're advocating for someone who cannot advocate for themselves. And you're advocating for someone who, whose family may not even be advocating for them because maybe their family member is the suspect in their death. So these are things you have to think about. Who are you? What is your um, purpose? Also, purpose could be like for law enforcement um, charges. Are you looking to get the charges authorized? Are you looking for a conviction in court? Maybe exonerating an accused person? And uh, I like putting the old statement in there, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts, because you have to think of your writing being objective versus subjective. You want to think about you're a gatherer of fact. You should be coming up and delivering facts rather than conclusions. Um, your like, police reports shouldn't say, because of this, this, and that, this person did it for sure. You know, you're looking at, you're kind of, you're saying I found this person's fingerprints or I found this there or this is the person's alibi or lack of alibi. You're providing information and it's something I explain to my investigators for the ME's office is that you are the eyes, ears of the medical examiner's office, but they're never the mouth. So they're not coming up with conclusions. So I, I run into problems if I have an investigator who tells a family member, oh, this person definitely had a cardiac issue and they give them basically a conclusion for like a cause of death 
and the medical examiner uh, does a post-mortem exam, they perform an autopsy, and then it's something else. And I have had family members call me and say, hey, this death certificate says something else than what the investigator told me. And now they're upset because even though even though it's still a nat maybe it's a still a natural form of death, they're upset now because they were told one thing versus another. So being careful as to how you deliver your information. Um, also, in the end, you want to make sure that you're painting a picture for, of the events of what happened. You want whoever picks up this report to read it, whether it's a um, prosecutor who's looking at these charges or a family member or law enforcement who's reading your report, that they understand what happened. They understand what the scene looked like. They understand what you're trying to explain to them. Next point here is to make sure you organize your thoughts. This is important because if you're jumping all over the place, um, it's very hard to follow. Has anybody here ever read somebody's paper, whether it be a uh, literary story or just a really a good research paper that you're assigned to, and it's really hard to follow that person's thinking because they jump all over the place? but they have some really good points, but they jump all over the place and you can't follow it. Has anybody experienced that before? Oops. So I just talk about don't put the cart before the horse, right? Make sure you know what, what you're doing here. So, and we'll go back to that. We'll talk a little bit more when we talk about transitions. <laughs> but you wanna make sure you develop your points, you clarify what you're saying. So in law enforcement, you wanna make sure that your report is covering the elements of a crime because you're investigating crimes typically or you're investigating something that might um, people thought it was a crime but it's not a crime because you're lacking certain elements so you want to have that so malicious destruction of property something that would be important is that there's actually property that has been destroyed so if you don't talk about that then it could be confusing or maybe charges don't get authorized because there's no actual destruction I like this last sentence I put in there. You want, when you're writing, you want to develop your points, you want to clarify, but you also want to avoid confusion. Um, see how this word order doesn't make sense? I had to read it a couple times when I first saw this. They're trying to say that the decedent was found by the father with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Just the order makes you read it a couple times. I, I almost thought the father inflicted the gunshot wound because I read it the first time, <laughs> okay? Does that make sense? Everybody else see, see how that could happen? Um, so who did what? Um, uh, I like to avoid using he and she too many times in reports because sometimes you have two or three people that you're interviewing or, or who are interacting um, with one another or interact, who had interactions with your decedent and so if you don't use names and you constantly use he and she, you can lose track and now you find yourself kind of trying to follow back what happened. Um, make sure your descriptions are specific and meaningful. Um, the person was injured. That doesn't tell me how they were injured, right? It doesn't tell me um, where the injury was, but it tells me, but how about they were bleeding versus they were injured? And maybe what kind of a cut was it? You know, where was this cut? What was the size of the cut? Um, an injury for assaults, for example, or battery, you know, if you're gonna include the person was injured, um, okay, they were injured, but how and where? What kind of injury? A uh, person was upset. Um, you know, you may say the person was visibly upset because they were crying. In, it seems so literal, but if somebody else is reading that and you just said upset, well, somebody might come back to you and say, why was the person upset? Or how could you tell this person was upset? So these are things you would describe. And then I, I like to add in there to include uh, pertinent negatives, um, things that are missing, whether it be a factor of an element of a crime, but how about this? Um, we have cases that sometimes we suspect the person overdosed on drugs, but there's no drugs at the scene. So you might want to, it's important to put in that there was no drugs there, right? Um, that's a pertinent negative. Uh, or how about there was an injury to the one arm, but there's no injury on the rest of the body. So if the person's saying they got hit by a car, uh, you know, they witness, or they, you know, somebody's found on the side of the road, somebody thinks, oh, because they're on the side of the road, they got hit by a car but there's only injury to um, their arm. But there's no injury to the rest of their body. You know, it might be important to know that, right? And then I, I also, I, this one thing I have to emphasize, everybody makes, I like to do my reports in the first person. I know some fields do not. They use it, the undersigned, 
or they refer to them as the reporting officer. Um, I think even some medical fields, they refer to themselves as the undersigned. It's confusing. I, using I did this and I did that, it doesn't leave the reader with questions as to you, you actually did it. When you're talking about yourself in the third person, it's like you're looking in on yourself and it just becomes confusing. I don't know if anybody has read reports like that, but it becomes very confusing as to um, who did what versus just I. I did this, I did not do that, I did this, you know, and I saw this. So back to organizing thoughts, but I, the way you can organize thoughts is through transitions. This is an example of um, our current death investigation headings that we use, that I have all my investigators use when they're doing a report. And these are our old headings. The reason why we changed is, can you imagine if somebody's writing under history, they're writing the history of this person, all their medical history, all their social history, all the events that led up to their death. Um, maybe they're talking about an injury that happened a year ago, and it could be very confusing, as well as it, the timeline might start jumping everywhere. So we broke it down into anti-mortem events. What happened just before this person died? You know, whether it be, well, we were talking and we were drinking, and this person also was taking medications or was taking drugs at the same time. Uh, we were up all night. They walked away, and I heard a big crashing sound and found them at the bottom of the stairs. You know, so you're, what led up to their death? Medical social history would be more of, what's their medical history? You know, does this person have a history of heart problems, high blood pressure? You're gonna talk about maybe anything they've got, ever gone to the doctor for, or it might be that they have no medical history, they've never gone to a doctor before. And then your social history would be stuff like, does this person drink or smoke? Do they use drugs? So by splitting it up, what happens is when we're doing our morning meetings, we can easily just go to those headings and we have a better idea of what happened with each case. I'm gonna use an example too for the malicious destruction of property, trying to hit the elements of a crime, making sure you know damage, um, evidence, what was collected, witness statements, suspects, if you made an arrest, what was the disposition, how did the case end? Transitions are nice because they're easy to follow, but the other part is uh, you're following APA style. Is everybody familiar with APA and MLA style? In the sciences, typically you're using APA style and headings are part of that and it really makes reports easy to follow and so I really push that upon my investigators. Um, they're required to use those headings I listed. There's not an option. If they turn in a report without those headings, I give it back to them and tell them to add the headings in. So the next thing is we want to be concise. We want to limit repeating things over and over again, um, avoid wordy phrases, um, put an end to versus stop or cease. You know, one's clear, less words. So if you get too wordy, um, it becomes hard to follow and sometimes you lose information in there. Um, example would be saying there was no injury on an arm, there was no injury on his leg, there was no injury on his back. So you're telling me basically you did a full inspection of this person's body. So you could easily say the only injury I found was on his right arm or right shoulder versus, or there was no other injuries or there was no injuries at all, you know, versus lifting, listing every body part. I only use that example because somebody actually did that. So I was like, wow, I'm like, I, I believe you, you were thorough, but you could just tell me there was no other injuries. And then an example like based on the fact that versus just because. So think of also when you're doing your investigations, you're doing research. Everybody here has done a research report, right? You've all been asked to do research reports rather than 10 pages or 20 pages, right? So interviews and investigations, I mean investigations, they have interviews, that's part of your research, where you're gathering your facts from. You wanna say who you spoke with, what did they tell you, um, and you're fact checking, right? When I talk to this witness and then I talk to that witness, or, and you may have two different perspectives, and you may be able to see the backside of somebody, because so you could see something that they were doing versus you were on the other side, you couldn't see it. I had a case where I was involved, um, where we had some witnesses who could see everything that was happening, but they were behind glass doors, so they couldn't hear anything. And then we had other people who could hear, but couldn't see, so they could hear the yelling and screaming and the words that were being used, but they couldn't see what was happening. So there were different perspectives, right? 
And then evidence, you know, remember there's different kinds of evidence. There's physical and testimonial. All right, so I just used a couple examples here. This is what's wrong with this report. Since we were talking about malicious destructions of property, I pulled one of these reports. Uh, it was a police report. Give me something, what, what would, it's short, so you can read through it, it's real short. You want me to read it? No, I just want you to tell me, what would you like to know that's not there? People can yell out too if you want to help her. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I just, you know, I blacked out uh, names and just an address, but okay. So who, but we also don't know if that person's the owner, right? We. We refer to the damage as graffiti, but what is graffiti? Is that somebody? Could it be a pen too? Could it be a marker? Could it be a Sharpie marker? What does it look like? What does this graffiti look like? We don't know, right? You say the south side, but we also don't understand what part of the south side the mm -hmm. well window. All right, was it on the house, was it on the windows of the house? So there's a lot of information that's missing. So you guys aren't trained in law enforcement, but you guys see that, right? There's information that's missing here. Is, it, is that also like it says there's several other graffiti complaints, but is it on his rentals earlier in the week, or is it on the area? I only know because I, um, I'm familiar with the case, so I, there were several other graffitis in the area. Um, but we also don't know if it's similar graffiti because they never describe it. So how do you think if we have, what if we have 10 cases of graffiti and they're all the same? It's a tagging. So uh, anybody familiar with taggers, people who use a certain trademark as their name, right? What if it's, and people tend to use the same trademark and if you do handprint or writing analysis, you can see it's the same stroke, or it's the same kind of dot, the same kind of marking. So you could tie all these 10 cases together. How hard is it to tie them together if I have only this as a report. It's hard. And then the other thing, you know, in our case, in our department, we took photos of everything, but that means I now have to go back through every photo <laughs> to try and figure out now match cases with just photos versus uh, other people might be like, oh, I read, you know, your detective bureau and is usually, or your administrative staff is usually reading through these reports, so they're gonna have it in their head. Oh, this case is similar to that one and they're gonna put them together versus this one we don't know. So it's a wild card. We're gonna have it sit out there and we have to go look at the photos to see if it's related or not to tie it in. And I've been in many cases where we had streaks of graffiti going on for months and then all of a sudden we find the person and we link them to all of them. So now we're going back digging up and pulling out all the cases because those are all charges, right? It's a little better. Again, I blotted out the names and locations. But see how this has more information and they used headings. All right, so in the end I asked like why is it, uh, why is report writing, uh, report writing important, right? This is what the whole point of this symposium is, right? It's why is it important? And so you have to, because of your purpose, and I, for my investigators I tell them it's because you're advocating for others. You're advocating for someone else. Um, once you're dead, you can't advocate for yourself anymore, right? <laughs> There's nobody there to sit there and say that, um, there may not be anybody there to sit there and say you were murdered. Um, I had a, an infant who, was, uh, who died and it made it look like a sleeping situation. And after further investigation, um, this child was killed. It ended up being a homicide case. Um, and so, and it was, it was a relative who had killed him. And the mom had some idea. She had to have known what was going on, but she also wasn't advocating for this child. So I spent about seven hours investigating and about two hours writing a report. And I love to say that I, I was having a conversation with Nora before I started that it never went to court. He settled out of court, he pled guilty. And I, fear, I feel that because of law enforcement, uh, report writing, our reports that we took and our investigation, and then the investigation from the pathologist and their examination, that it didn't go to court because there was no loopholes. There was nothing to try and fight through. 
it was really, all our stuff was put together. Um, remember that many people are evaluating your work. So um, whether it be your boss or the public, I mean, let's talk about the O.J. Simpson case. How messed up was that case with the collecting of evidence and how things were put together? And basically, it wasn't put together well, and that's probably why they lost that case. They couldn't prove anything. Um, they, could, they ended up being on trial. Actually, how the officers ended up being on trial versus um, the person they wanted to actually be on trial. They were questioned for their tactics, their lack of um, proper steps. And I'm not saying that O.J. was guilty or not guilty. I'm just saying that whoever got te who, had the, who was on trial was the report and the investigative process versus the actual events that happened. And so you'll see that um, they'll, they'll look at inconsistencies, your reputation will be tarnished. Um, what happened with LAPD's reputation when it came to that case? <coughs> you want to make sure that part of your purpose is to, you know, why you're writing this is listing proper elements of a crime. Um, as I said, you can encourage cases that are not going to court because defense attorneys are looking at cases and they're trying to find something that they can argue against, say something you didn't do or information you don't have. And trust me, even if you do everything, there's always some weird thing that comes up. I've had plenty of those cases where you're like, wow, I would have just never thought of that. Now I will. It'll probably never come up again, but I'll think of that now. Um, but there's things that come up, but you don't want these huge loopholes. You don't want these huge openings. Like I said, remember, if you don't put it in your report, it didn't happen. So if I fail to say I Mirandized somebody, and then I question them while they were in custody, it's going to look like I didn't. I didn't. And it's going to be harder when I go back in court and they say, did you? And you say, yes. And it's going to, why wasn't it in your report? Why didn't you say it in your report that you did Mirandize this person? So you end up being on the stand versus um, the case itself. And finally, grammar saves lives. <laughs> All right. Any questions? Have you ever found yourself like attached to a certain like case or report that you could like she asked me if I was able, if I was ever found myself attached to a case where I felt like if it didn't get solved, I couldn't move on to another one. You mean that? I can't say I. I can't say no. I can't say yes. I, I know that you, I've had cases that they sit out there and you feel like you have information and you dig and dig and dig and you can't get any further and you're, and you kind of just have to let it go. Um, especially in law enforcement when you're actually trying to uh, bring a case to a close. Um, with the medical examiner's office, our job is to really just put the information and feed it to law enforcement and say, this looks like a murder, um, and then we gather more information. I mean, I have a case that I'm working on right now that initially um, it looked like just an elder person who died, and it's looking more like an elder abuse, but we caught it, and uh, law enforcement didn't have a role initially, and so we asked them to get involved because we're not the ones who are going to bring charges forward, they are. And so um, sometimes we end up having to drive some of that part of the investigation and explain to them what they have to look for. But um, as you do this longer, you learn you have to let go of certain cases that sometimes you just can't, you're just not going to solve it. You can always add to your case. You can do supplemental reports. So sometimes when you start investigations, you have only this bit of information, this small bit of information. So like in this case that I'm talking about, a possible elder abuse, we initially only had information that you know, this woman had a long history of problems, health problems, on dialysis. Um, she, uh, you know, she passed away while sleeping. It seemed, seemed very natural, but then we learned because somebody else came forward days later saying that they think she was being over-medicated, <coughs> um, that she possibly won some money from a lawsuit and the money was missing. And so now you're starting to think, oh, wait a minute, 
therapist now is looking like maybe she was killed for her money. Um, and she didn't have any control of taking her meds. Somebody else gave them to her, and somebody was preventing her from using her dialysis machine. They weren't having her do her dialysis on a regular basis. So now it's starting to look like possibly elder neglect. I'm not sure if we can will ever rise to the level of homicide, but maybe at least to neglect. So you can always add information that comes along. Um, you never change your original. You do supplemental reports. Because if you find that you're changing your original report, I don't mean like an edit, like you read it the next day and you're like, oh, this is incorrect. I mean like it's a month later, you get more information, or two days later, you just add supplemental reports to it. So even in the Emmy's office, there's all the times that, because as the chief investigator, I'm doing a lot of follow-up interviews and a lot of follow-up on, on, on my MEI's cases, so I'll add reports, I'll add supplements to that. Any other questions? I see a smile over there. There's a question? No. When you were going through your undergrad, um, did you have any idea that writing was going to be such a major part of your job? Um, and either way, um, what advice can you give to students who may not also realize how they will be using writing in the future? Um, when I was going through undergrad, I liked writing. <laughs> so I don't know how many people here like writing, but I liked writing. At Grand Valley, we had these SWS courses that if you, um, I don't even remember what SWS stands for anymore, um, but you could take a course, like you could take a, um, you could take a culture course, you could either take it as a basic culture course or you could take it as an SWS. And the SWS meant there was more writing involved and you were gonna do more paperwork, uh, more, more papers, and I, I would take, the SWS version of it because I wanted to write. I liked writing. But I didn't realize how much, I really didn't fully ex understand the extent of how writing was going to be important until I was in law enforcement and you had those first couple of cases that you write up and um, you get asked 20 questions and you're like, well, I said that. Well, I, okay, I guess I really didn't say that. And you're like, well, I meant that. And okay, I, I guess I did mean it, but it doesn't really say it here because I wasn't clear enough. Um, and, and sometimes you learn through trial and error that you have to come back and give more, people more information. Um, but I would suggest that if you, for undergrads, I, I, I would suggest that even if it's not your strong suit, I would suggest that you take more classes um, that involve writing. Um, sometimes you have to attack on head on what you don't like doing. Because if you avoid it, it's going to haunt you in the end because it's going to come up. You're going to have to write. And what happens when you are in your first job and they ask you to write some type of presentation or some type of report you have to put together and you're like, boy, they're expecting this because I have a college degree that I can do this. And you can't. And one, admitting it, you should admit it, but you won't have to, well, don't want to be in a position where you have to admit it that you can't do that. Um, but people have a certain expectation that because you have a graduate degree or an undergraduate degree that you um, you pass the courses for writing, so they're expecting a certain le level of quality of writing, correct? And so if you show up and you can't write it, it's, it's going to be embarrassing um, more than anything. So I would suggest you tackle it head on. If you're struggling with the basics, like I said, the guy who I talked about earlier, really great guy, he does really great investigations, his reports struggle because of it. I can see the information there, but I, he's, not, he's not delivering it in a great manner and that's going to affect him. And I would suggest that you go back and take a basic class. If you can't, um, you know, if you don't want to take the more advanced like writing classes because maybe you're not even at that level, go back and take your core classes. Go back and take a base class. Even go to your writing workshop and have somebody help you and explain to you, well, why is this wrong? Why is this incorrect? Or how, how can I work on learning where to use commas? Um, you know, look up different resources. I, I put on here, these are a couple sources I use. I subscribe to Grammarly because they give you fun information all the time as to, oh, the debate on the Oxford comma. You know, <laughs> you know, what's the debate? Do we use it? Do we not use it? Who wants to use it? And does it make sense to use it? And it's just they deliver good pieces of information in small clippets that it's not overwhelming. Also, um, the Grammar Girl site I've used, it's, again, explained in very simple terms. So I would suggest, you know, seek out that information that you're struggling with and just face it head on. Sometimes you'll learn that it's not as hard as you thought it was. When you were hired, or when you hire, or when you um, 
consider promotions. Do you assess writing during that process? And if so, what does the Well, I don't do a writing sample for my investigators. Um, and after this last guy, like I said, I almost thought about putting it in there that people would have to p uh, pass a writing sample test so I could see where their writing level is. Um, I do an extensive report writing class with my new investigators, but I, I expect that people know how to use commas and periods. <laughs> so I wasn't, I didn't realize what I was running into. Um, and like again, like I said, he does great investigations, and so, and, but he's open to learning, so, um, which is nice because now I know I can easily direct him. Um, but I've considered, I've considered doing little writing tests because it, making people write uh, sample and uh, investigative reports um, because before even hiring them, so I have an idea where their writing level is at. Um, because it could be a struggle. This, I mean, this is important. The information they deliver to our pathologists, um, so we can do a proper investigation. I'm the chief investigator for the medical examiner's office in Kalamazoo. Any other questions? For hiring practices, do you put a heavy focus on GPA or just overall credentials? Uh, for my particular hiring practices, I uh, experience is going to be what I put a heavy focus on. Um, if you submitted to me um, a resume that said you had criminal justice classes, I, I can't hire you. You don't have enough investigative experience. <laughs> um, I'm teaching, I'm trying to get people who have actually some investigative experience. Um, as a medical examiner investigator, it's not a stepping stone to go into other jobs. I need people to be seasoned. So I'm looking for people who are like retired officers or currently officers. I'm also looking for people who are like EMTs or uh, paramedics. People who have some type of, I'm either looking, I'm looking for two types of people. Either people who have heavy investigative experience and maybe very little medical, and I can, they'll learn either way, or very, they might have a lot of medical, and maybe their investigative s skills have to be um, honed in. Uh, EMTs, paramedics, they have investigative skills already because they interview people all the time when they go to scenes about how are you feeling, what's going on, what, you know, so they already have some of that um, investigative experience. Um, but typically, I have people who say they're interested in criminal justice, and this would be a great stepping stone for them into their criminal justice field. And my intention is not to take somebody who has no investigative knowledge at all and train you for how many years and get you really honed in, and then you're going to leave. I need people who are already experienced. Any other questions? Well, thank you, everybody, uh, for being a good audience and not falling asleep. <laughs>